ഞാൻ പ്രധാനമായിട്ടും ഡബ്ല്യു എച്ച് ഒ ഗൈഡ്ലൈനും ഗവൺമെന്റ് ഓഫ് ഇന്ത്യ ഗൈഡ്ലൈനും ബേസ് ആയിട്ടാണ് ഇന്ന് ഇവിടെ പ്രസന്റേഷൻ റെഡിയാക്കിയിട്ടുള്ളത് നമുക്കറിയാം കേരളത്തിലെ ഏത് മെഡിക്കൽ കോളേജിൽ നമ്മൾ ഹൗസ് സർജൻസി ചെയ്താലും സ്നേക്ക് ബൈറ്റ് കാണാതെ പാസ്സാവാൻ ബുദ്ധിമുട്ടാണ് ഹൗസ് സർജൻസി പീരീഡിൽ സ്നേക്ക് ബൈറ്റ് എന്തായാലും നമ്മൾ മാനേജ് ചെയ്തിട്ടുണ്ടാവും പലരും വളരെ സീനിയേഴ്സ് ആണ് ഒരു പക്ഷെ വളരെയേറെ എക്സ്പീരിയൻസ് ഉള്ളവരും നമ്മുടെ കൂടെ ഉണ്ട് അപ്പൊ ദിവ്യ പറഞ്ഞതുപോലെ നമുക്ക് ഇതിന് ശേഷം വി വിൽ ഹാവ് എ വെരി ആക്റ്റീവ് ഇന്ററാക്ഷൻ ഞാനും ഇതൊരു ഓപ്പർച്യൂണിറ്റി ആയിട്ടാണ് എടുത്തത് ഇന്നലെ പറഞ്ഞപ്പോൾ എന്ന് വെച്ചാൽ സ്നേക്ക് ബൈറ്റും നമ്മുടെ ഏറ്റവും വലിയൊരു പ്രയോറിറ്റിയാണ് സ്നേക്ക് ബൈറ്റ് ഇപ്പോഴും മരണങ്ങൾ സംഭവിക്കുന്ന ഒരു പ്രശ്നമാണ് ഒരുപാട് പബ്ലിക് ഹെൽത്ത് ഇന്റർവെൻഷൻസ് ഇങ്ങനെ സ്നേക്ക് ബൈറ്റ് അവോയ്ഡ് ചെയ്യാം ആൻഡ് ഓൾസോ ഹൗ വി ക്യാൻ പ്രിവെൻറ്റ് ഫസ്റ്റ് എയ്ഡ് പോലുള്ള കാര്യങ്ങൾ ദർ ഇസ് ലോട്ട് ഓഫ് മിസ്കൺസെപ്ഷൻസ് ഡിലേ ഇൻ പേഷ്യൻറ്റ് റീച്ചിങ് ദ സിസ്റ്റം ദർ ആർ ലോട്ട് മെനി തിങ്സ് വി ക്യാൻ ആക്ച്വലി ഇൻ്റർവീൻ അതുകൊണ്ട് തന്നെ വി വിൽ ഹാവ് എ ആക്റ്റീവ് ഇൻ്ററാക്ഷൻ എമങ് അവർ സെസ് നമുക്ക് സ്നേക്ക് ബൈറ്റ് എന്ന് പറയുമ്പോൾ വി ഹാവ് ടു സി ഇസ് ഇറ്റ് ആൻ ഇഷ്യൂ ഫോർ അസ് എവറി വൺ വിൽ ഡെഫിനറ്റ്ലി സേ യെസ് occupational hazard among farmers plantation workers other outdoor workers including our household uh, women most of the time they come with snake bite vaigit varagedukano okka pombo usually we see such uh, uh, types of bites in our day to day uh, patient management and it causes lot of morbidity and mortality and uh, this is an early study which showed 30000 per year in india and we all agree that victim victims initially approach traditional healers for treatment even today and some may or may not even reach the hospital so whatever statistics we have if we really collect the snake bite data even that may be inadequate so we need to have adequate accurate statistics so that we can plan this patient management appropriately so in our presentation today we can see what are the clinical features of different types of snake bite and what are the current management guidelines and as i have told uh, uh, we in fact i couldn't do the uh, uh, extensive reading on the recent updates because i have been primarily focusing on the guidelines who guidelines and the indian guidelines always we are fascinated by identification of snake and uh, even in college days i remember whenever a snake is brought all of us will be around that and to see what it is and what is the type of snake and we all enjoy uh, seeing and identifying it correctly but now we know that uh, we killing snake is also a problem and we are not supposed to bring or ask them to bring the snakes uh, killed so if if at all possible we can ask them to get a photograph in such situations if we could give a training of them uh, this is important because the manifestation of snake bite depends upon the species of snake but we never treat the snake or the, the snake that they have brought we are actually treating the patient the clinical manifestations of the patient may not correlate with the species of snake brought as evidence we all know that because they bring any snake and we have to see actually see the patient and not the not focus more on the snake they had they had, that they have brought and we know that we have cobra king cobra great coral snake viper rhesus viper so scale viper pit viper these are the ones that we commonly see so i thought of avoiding these such pictures and identifying snakes but i thought it will be always better to have a feel of our today's discussion also when we see some of these snakes which are very commonly seen and this is the common crate this is the viper russell viper this is the saw scale viper and this is the pit viper so maybe these five are the common ones that we see in our clinical practice there are many species of snake but only very few are actually poisonous and we have seen the problem once for us in our clinical practice and two thirds of bites are attributed to so scale viper across india but we see of other ones 
pit viper, Russell viper, and cobra and crage usually. So this is the big four, but uh, more than so scale viper, we may all of us might have been seeing uh, pit viper, which is producing long uh, prolongation of clotting time, and always we used to worry about whether the patient has actually improved or not. And we know that there is seasonal variation, more common in summers and in the rainy season. Do not bite without provocation. And males, it's more common because of the more of the act, uh, work involved. And uh, you, you get bite more in the lower extremities. And we also know that there is something called dry bites. Even if they bring a poisonous snake, Sometimes the bite will be dry with negligible envenomation. So that's why I always, uh, earlier also we stressed that uh, we need to see what is the actual symptoms of the patient rather than the snake that they brought. Because there could be dry bites as well. There is negligible envenomation. And we know the toxic effects of snake bite. Normal function is to immobilize the prey and to assist in digestion. So there is phospholipase A2, that is the more, more important component, but we have hyaluronidase. This helps to spread the venom faster. Alpha neurotoxin, beta neurotoxins, polypeptides, all these are the important ones. And among them, the most important or extensively studied one is phospholipase A2. And it has got neurotoxicity, cardiotoxicity, myotoxicity, and all these, and plasma leakage, producing capillary leak syndrome and decoagulant effect. So the opiate-like sedative effect, some of them go into drowsiness when they get bitten by snakes. So this is about the snake, but now we move on to the clinical features of snake bite. And we know that whenever a person comes with the history of snake bite, more important feature that we always come across is the fear and anxiety. They hyperventilate, they say they have pins and needle sensation in the extremity, spasm of their hands and feet, dizziness, and all of these can happen because of a poisonous bite as well. So we have to be very careful when they come with these symptoms and always we have to make the patient calm and the relatives calm and uh, vasovagal shock, it could be due to the bite itself or suspected bite, painless collapse with profound slowing of the heart. And sometimes the patient may become highly agitated and behave irrationally. And especially when they come with an alcohol pinch, we, 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 all the, we become confused in the casualty. And it also depends upon the age and size of the patient, species of snake, the number and location of the bites, and the quantity and toxicity of venom injected. All this uh, decides how the patient presents to us. So we should ask where and when the bite occurred when a person comes with a history of snake bite. A description of the snake, if they bring or if they bring a photograph, we can see what it is, we can try to identify, but we should not be spending too much time in getting the snake or trying to identify the snake, how the bite occurred and whether there was more than one bite, any signs or symptoms, timing of onset. If the patient says there is vomiting, abdominal pain, ptosis, bleeding from the uh, wound. We can ask all those things and we can document. Initial treatment, first aid was provided, including timing of first aid. And usually traditional healers, they might apply something or cut the wound. All sorts of things must be discouraged or should not be uh, allowed or it's, they should be informed that it's not uh, doing more harm than good. And alcohol intake or recent recreational drug use, that will modify the patient's presentation past medical history, current medications patient on, if the patient is on oral anticoagulants or beta blockers for a underlying heart disease, and history of prior snake bites and history of antivenom, history of allergy, all this will give us a good idea about how we should manage, but at least we have to get a quick history. And we know that there are many factors that will decide the outcome. Uh, size of the victim. In smaller child, the, there is more likely to have a severe uh, envenomation, comorbidity, part bitten. If it is on the upper part, on into their vessel, blood vessels, they have a higher risk of developing toxicity. Exercise, if they run after the bite, they are more likely to have a systemic absorption, individual sensitivity, bite characteristics, species of snake we have already discussed, and secondary infection. 
there will be anaerobic organisms in the mouth of the snake and that will cause uh, secondary infection and uh, we we should also see whether they have already received some sort of uh, a, a local application or things like that and whether they have received the antivenom and this is just to see what is the fatal dose for humans and how much it is actually injected. If it's not a dry bite, if it's a bite, they usually it's the amount that it's getting injected and average fatal period. But this is not uh, that important to us, but it just, just says that how uh, severe this could be. So now we move on to the clinical features per se, local changes. We all know systemic symptoms. Nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and malaise, prostration, neurological manifestations, psychosis, ophthalmoplegia, paralysis of uh, muscles, respiratory failure, upper airway obstruction, intercostals, diaphragm, and, uh, and eventually leading on to respiratory failure and death. Hemorrhage and increased capillary permeability leads to shock and pulmonary edema. And there could be other areas like intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid or all sorts of complications can happen. And acute kidney injury, oliguria, and renal failure. So these are some of the pictures. These pictures, uh, in fact, I have taken from the uh, article itself. So they have marked it, so it's like that. And uh, uh, we can see the fang marks and we have to measure the see, edema all those things and we, we should document the, whether the patient has got local pain and these are the type of presentation lymphedema lymph lymph, uh, lymph node enlargement tender lymphadenopathy bullous formation persistent oozing and bleeding from the wound and if there is a delay or if uh, this is the later pictures of the patient that could develop abscess at the site necrosis and they may heal very badly if, even if we do the adequate care of the wound and it may take longer period to heal even if the patient survives. So we need to have a long-term management of the local symptoms. Other important symptom we have to think is compartment syndrome. If there is a sudden increase in, in intracompartmental intra pressure with edema, uh, vascular leakage. So we know this uh, uh, peace, pain, pallor, paresthesia, pulselessness, paralysis, and we should understand that we have to ensure that there is, a, uh, there is no risk of bleeding or hemostasis is attained before we embark into procedures, but sometimes we have to do both hand in hand uh, in some situations where there is actually pulseless and uh, very, uh, there is uh, uh, pallor and uh, pulselessness. And this is other important, we have seen many times, this is the capillary leak syndrome with the conjunctival edema parotid enlargement and patient puffiness and patient will have pleural and pericardial effusions, pulmonary edema, albuminuria, hemoconcentration, severe hypotension. So this is actually caused by recess wiper. So this sort of manifestation should really frighten us because there is a, a, a real evidence of significant envenom. Bleeding and clotting disorders, traumatic bleeding from recent wounds, Spontaneous systemic bleeding from gums, epistaxis, intracranial hemorrhage, hemoptysis, hematomasis, rectal bleeding, melina, petechia purpura, and ecchymosis. All these manifestations can happen. So we have seen about the local findings, compartment syndrome, capillary leak syndrome, bleeding and clotting disorders, bleeding manifestations. This is very, very important. That's a neurological cobra crate and recess wiper. We can see that there is furrowing with the ptosis. And the patient may complain of, or the patient may have drowsiness, paresthesia, abnormalities of taste and smell, doses, external ophthalmoplegia, facial muscle paralysis, aphonia, regurgitation, and all those cranial nerve involvement symptoms can happen and they start to spread in generalized flaccid paralysis. So these are uh, our own patients. Patients came, this is a patient with great and this is Cobra. They are both of them had Doses at presentation, and uh, this is not uh, no. I know I am sure all of or most of you might have had this sort of seen these sort of presentation to the fact. This is uh, actually discussed because of the paralysis. There is a broken neck, and this may last longer even if you treat with the with the envenomation. And in this case, neuroparalysis persisted for longer duration. So the sign this is otherwise known as broken neck sign. 
and endocrine we know that it could be adrenal hemorrhage pituitary hemorrhage infarction shock and hypoglycemia and the longer patient might come back to us with hypopituitarism and uh, we have to ask whether there was any history of snake bite in the past long term complications physical disability as i have already shown if there is a severe uh, involvement there could be uh, that might take uh, longer and the patient may actually have physical disability because of the wound and uh, prolonged uh, healing and marjolin ulcer chronic kidney disease pan hypopituitarism diabetes post traumatic stress disorder all these are described as long term complication so we need to remember occult snake bite there is no bite mark usually happens in paid bite and victims often present in the early morning uh, uh, many of the post graduates in medicine at least diagnose one case where the patient comes with paralysis with no local signs no history of snake bite no bite marks they get up in the morning with severe uh, they get up in the morning with severe epigastric pain vomiting persisting for 3 to 4 hours followed by typical neuroparalytic symptoms within next 4 to 6 hours there is no history of bite so they won't say that there is any history of snake bite so we have to remember about this also because it is very well treatable if you recognize that it could be due to snake bite so we have to identify or we have to look whether there is any chance that this patient had a risk of getting or risk of a bitten by a snake now we move on to the management for stay treatment transport to hospital rapid clinical assessment and resuscitation on visit first presentation detailed clinical assessment species diagnosis investigations and the snake venom treatment observing the response to asv deciding whether further dose of asvs are needed supportive treatment treatment of the bitten part rehabilitation advising how to avoid future bites and management of chronic complications so we have some clues for severe snake envenomation snake identified is a very venomous one rapid early extension of local swelling from the site of the bite early tender enlargement of local lymph nodes lymphadenopathy tender lymphadenopathy indicating spread of venom to the lymphatic system early systemic symptoms and early spontaneous systemic bleeding especially bleeding from the gums and oliguria passage of dark brown urine all these things will give us a clue that this patient is likely having a a uh, very severe envenomation we need to put us on the immediate management and uh, definitely management or long term care that we will have to give in this patient that is very important for the survival of the patient and local management we are we have been saying again and again and again and all of you are aware but i am putting this slide again because patients are coming with tight tunicates and this is leading to Uh, gangrene formation or, or even loss of limb or toe or finger so do not tie tunicates as it may cause gangrenous limb if we mix victim is expected to reach the hospital in more than 30 minutes but less than 3 hours scrub bandage may be applied by qualified medical practice personnel if the patient is shifted to the hospital the bandage is wrapped over the bitten area as well as the entire limb with the limb placed in a splint it should be capable of admitting a finger beneath it i think we need to uh, advise again in our local group so that they will be aware that we don't have to apply tight tunicate and uh, even release of the tunicate we have to be very careful that the patient might develop sudden worsening or uh, worsening or the envenoming and patient might have serious problems so this is one way pressure immobilization or we can just put a, as we send a patient with fracture we can put a scale or something and just immobilize the limb and send the patient to the hospital like this reassure the patient take to the nearest health facility victim must not run or drive himself to reach the health facility no time should be wasted in attempting to kill or capture the snake and do not handle the snake with your bare hands as even a severed head can bite so this has to be very clearly educated to the public so this if nothing is possible we need to just immobilize like a fractured limb do not apply tunicate and uh, this sort of uh, immobilization is also advised but not the conventional one that we used to see by tying with a tight rope as the patient reaches to us we have to do a quick assessment as in any other patient coming to the emergency department 
airway breathing circulation disability exposure and environmental control so we have to see airway is patent breathing normal circulation see for the blood pressure and start a iv large bore iv cannula and expose the patient see for any uh, bite marks and see for the temperature and all those things we have to do and then urgently in the uh, emergency department or casualty and another important message we should not go for glasgow farmers care because most of the time they will not be able to respond or they will not be properly paralyzed by the neurotoxic venom so we have to have a proper assessment and even if the patient is not responding we need to look for bite mark and we need to plan management so clinical situations requiring urgent resuscitation profound hypotension and shock start with the iv fluid use large iv bore cannula and the blood if there is bleeding severe bleeding disturbances respiratory failure respiratory arrest go for intubation and if we cannot do we have to use something available like bag, bag and mask ventilation and the patient may go into sudden deterioration cardiac arrest acute kidney injury septicemia complicating the local necrosis so we have to be aware which are the ones that we need to adjust immediately and mechanical ventilation and they have also given this that we have to avoid sedatives and neuromuscular blocking agent because they might be having neurotoxic envenomation and uh, they have uh, advised that uh, but this uh, who guideline has advised sedation for patients being mechanically ventilated so but we have to assess whether the patient has got neuromuscular blockade or neurotoxic envenomation physical examination examination of the bitten part extent of swelling and tenderness tender lymph nodes ecchymosis lymphangitis compartment syndrome early signs of necrosis and we have to document the vitals so hemorrhages stosis eye movements respiration or these things we usually do but i have just listed and uh, do not assume that snake bitten patients are unconscious or even irreversibly brain dead just because their eyes are closed they are unresponsive to painful stimuli are air refluxic or have fixed dilated pupils they may merely be paralyzed and they may be severely paralyzed and lack motor responses or spontaneous eye movements mimicking coma or locked in syndrome so we have to check pulse heart sounds and impossible ecg and we have to identify and we have to keep this in mind this paralytic state that this patient may come to the hospital we can see go for the single breath count or ask the patient to hold the breath these are the things we usually do we do not have much facilities also we can do and we can do the saturation by using pulse oximeter ability to complete uh, sentences also look for ptosis diplopia dysarthria dysphonia dysphagia paralysis paradoxical respiration saturation drop all these are possible and we have to document how we have received the patient in the hospital this is just to say in cobra produces primarily neurotoxicity and significant local reaction crate is primarily a neurotoxic by tresses viper can produce all but uh, predominantly hematotoxicity local reaction aki and uh, so scale viper so scale viper usually produces coagulopathy <coughs> and this hamnospis viper okay so when a patient present with a history of snake bite but no dead snake and little or no description of the snake we can go for local swelling if there is local swelling see for neurology signs also see for the uh, uh, whole blood clotting time if the neurologic signs are there and non clotting blood spontaneous systemic bleeding nothing is there but early bristling necrosis it could be cobra neurotoxic bite with local reaction neurotoxic bite and acute renal failure we have to think of process viper and the neurotoxic signs uh, this is great uh, and we know that predominantly hemotoxic and uh, uh, no neurotoxic signs acute renal failure we have to think of a viper bite okay so this is also similar one viper produces local necrosis ecchymosis blistering painful swelling compartment syndrome we have to give acute uh, anti snake venom and cobra or crate we know we have already discussed the neurotoxic bite and we have to consider 
anti snake venom and if situations are not favorable we can also try atropine eostigmine combination but in the, all these patients actually we getting ventilatory support if there is respiratory paralysis Russell swiper we have to give anti snake venom supportive treatment dialysis if needed and blood transfusion or fresh frozen plasma fresh frozen plasma in those situations where there is a coagulopathy Okay, and we, we are not actually discussing about the myotoxic bite of the sneeze snake, which is actually not very common and uh, we are not going to discuss it today. So, where is one way that we can go for the syndromic approach, local envenomation with bleeding clotting disturbances, it's more likely a viper bite. Uh, bleeding clotting disturbance uh, and with acute kidney injury, ptosis, all these are together. New, all the four are there, neurotoxic, nephrotoxic, acute kidney injury, and hemotoxic. Definitely, we have to think of Russell's wiper. And syndrome three, local inflammation with paralysis or neurotoxic bite, cobra or king cobra, or paralysis with minimal or no local inflammation, that is great sea snake, and paralysis with dark brown urine, that is neurotoxic as well as acute kidney injury with bleeding, Russell's viper. So these are some of the combinations, but what is more important is when a patient comes to us, we have to see whether the patient has got local reaction, how, how much it is, how far it is, and we have to document it. We have to see whether there is signs of neurotoxicity, signs of chemotoxicity, and also assess laboratory estimation and urine output for seeing whether the patient has got evidence of uh, acute kidney injury or nephrotoxicity. So laboratory investigation, we are all very familiar with 20 minute whole blood clotting test. That is the one that we commonly use. But definitely we know that we have to think of other investigations depending upon the situation blood urea, creatinine, serum potassium, routine investigations and everything, urine estimation, urine albuminuria, all this we will be seeing in this patient along with other comorbidities that the patient is having, PTA, PTT, platelet count, all these are important, but most important bedside simple estimation is the 20 minute whole blood clotting test. So what it is, we get placed two ml of freshly sampled venous blood in a small new clean, dry glass vessel that has not been washed with any detergent. This is very, very important. If the uh, vial is washed with soap and we use it, it may not work properly. And we have to keep it undisturbed for 20 minutes. And if the blood is unclotted, venom-induced consumption coagulopathy is going to be our diagnosis. Classically seen in viper bite. And if we have any doubt whether there is a, a, a coagulopathy or not, or whether it is clotted or not, we can actually keep blood from a healthy person along with this as a control. But usually we do with the patient blood. <clears throat> we can get false positive results because of all the problems like tube, bottles, syringes, uh, if we use plastic uh, bottles, it is clean with the detergent or soap. So all these things may give a false positive or a false negative results. Patient is actually having coagulopathy, but our test is normal because in the early milder degrees of coagulopathy, it may be false negative. So even if we get a false, even if we get a negative test, we have to repeat it every hour for three hours. And then we have to monitor every six hours for remaining 24 hours because we don't want to miss a late manifestation of poisoning. And repeat six hours after administration of loading dose of ASV. In case of neurotoxic envenomation, we have to repeat after six hours. So even if we do and we start ASV, we will be repeating it after six hours. And even if the test is normal, we will be repeating it every hour for three hours and then every six hours for 24 hours. That means patient will be in the hospital for a minimum of 24 hours before sending them home saying that no non-poisonous snake bite. And in India, we use polyvalent snake venom, anti-snake venom, which is a lyophilized dried powder. It's powder, dry powder form. It is available as 10 ml. And we have 10 ml, uh, uh, distilled water is also available. So we have to form a solution for 10 ml. And we have to give it as intravenous infusion, a normal saline or 5% extra. And 
uh, given over 250 to 500 ml over one hour, depending upon the patient and the patient dehydration and other things, but we will administer it over one hour. And patient should be strictly observed for an hour for development of any anaphylactic reaction. We should have loaded adrenaline before starting the uh, ASV. And ASV sensitivity testing is not recommended and is not needed, but we will be giving it over a slower 15 drops over the first 15 minutes. Then we can, if there is no reaction, we can give the full dose. So this is the one currently available in our hospital. And I believe this will be there in every hospital. This will be the same one will be available. It's available as a freeze dry product with 10 ml ampule. So we can dissolve it and we will be making it a solution of uh, 10 ml of ASV. So we have loaded syringe of adrenaline at the bedside and we must be ready to administer if needed. And you see, we don't give it before if they're thinking that the patient might develop, but one of the studies say that if we have really worried about this, we can give 0.25 ml uh, subcutaneously in one guideline says, but usually we don't give, but we will be ready with the loaded syringe of adrenaline. And uh, it says that hydrocortisone and I will usually do not protect with the initial anaphylaxis that we want to treat in this patient. We have to give adrenaline itself. And uh, some uh, so there is no role for local ad administration of antivenom as well. It's painful and it may cause uh, intercompartmental pressure and compartmental syndrome. 20% patients treated with ASP may develop early or late reaction. Early reaction is actually the anaphylactic reaction, uh, itching, urticaria, dry cough, nausea, abdominal pain, vomiting, breathlessness. It can happen within 10 minutes. So we have to be very closely monitoring at the first hour. And we must be ready with the loaded adrenaline in case of patient develop severe life-threatening anaphylaxis like hypotension, bronchospasm, and angioedema. Pyrogenic reactions, we can give paracetamol. And some patients may have, after 1 to 12 days, may develop uh, serum sickness-like sin illness, vomiting, diarrhea, itching, and arthralgia, where we can give uh, avil and prednisolone, oral for 5 to 7 days, 5 milligrams, smaller dose of prednisolone. And suppose a patient develop anaphylaxis, stop ASV temporarily, give 0.5 milligram IM, injection adrenaline, see what is the response and repeat after five minutes. And if the patient is not improving or we are worried then patient is not responding the way we want, we can give IV adrenaline and keep the legs elevated and give IV fluid one to two liters bolus. And we can give other supportive measures like uh, chlorpheniramine malate 10 milligram, hydrocortisone 100 milligram. And once the patient is stabilized and recovered, we have to restart anti snake venom slowly for 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, most of the patients will be able to complete it, uh, even if they develop uh, this reaction, because this is the only drug that we can give for this patient. So even if we have a severe challenging situations, we will try to complete the anti snake venom once the patient is stabilized. So this is a very challenging situation if a person is practicing or in a smaller hospital. So in that situation, may if the facilities are not adequate, if you feel uh, we can refer the patient properly to the higher center. Ideally, administer within four hours, but we may give uh, within 24 hours or sometimes there is persistent uh, paralysis or nephro uh, hemotoxicity, we'll be giving it even the patient comes late. So how much ASV we should give? This is the Indian guidelines uh, from Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. They are saying neuroparalytic snake bite, ASV 10 vials we have to give over 30 minutes. And uh, we will see if the patient has got uh, symptoms recovering. And uh, thus, as per this guideline, we can give up to 20 vials if the patient is not improving. But actually, usually patient responds by 10 to 15 vials. Very rarely we will have to give 20 vials. But we have to reassess the patient and see whether the patient is improving or not. Hemotoxic or vascular toxic bite, we, there also we start with 10 vials. 
and repeat after six hours of infusion, we will see whether the patient has got whole blood clotting time has normal. Otherwise, again, we will give six vials before so scale wiper. And uh, 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 we can give either six vials or the next uh, six hours. So we can repeat it after the uh, reassessment. And uh, there is, they also put a high dose, but we, uh, what we usually do is we start with 10 vials and reassess. And then the patient has got symptoms persisting, that is ptosis and other respiratory paralysis persisting, or the, if the patient has got hemotoxicity, prolongation of whole blood clotting time, we can repeat. And neuroparalytic snake bed, we may repeat 10 vials itself, a maximum of 20 vials can be given. A repeat dose of ASP should be given when there is persistence of blood in coagulopathy even after six hours of continued bleeding after one to two hours of the initial dose. And should also be repeated when there are worsening of neurotoxic or cardiovascular signs even after one to two hours. So if there is a worsening of neurotoxic symptoms, we can repeat within one to two hours because we will be completing it within 30 to one hour. And uh, in hemotoxic bite, if there is ongoing bleeding from the site, that your uh, other bleeding manifestations we can repeat or otherwise we will be doing a whole blood clotting time after six hours and if there is worsening or if there is persistent prolongation we can do. So this is the whole blood 20 minute whole blood clotting time. So we do this uh, uh, and the, the, the 20 minute whole blood clotting time blood is not clotted. So we are giving 20 vials of ASV and repeat this whole blood clotting of time after six hours. Still blood is not clotted, we can give another 10 vials and again repeat after six hours. So after six hours, the blood is clotting, then we stop ASV. No ASV. And similarly, even if the bite is viper bite, but when we do the whole blood clotting time, there is clotting, we won't give ASV even if we think that the uh, snake they brought is viper, but we have to closely monitor, we have to repeat it, and we have to see whether there is any uh, worsening or whether there is any manifestation of the, uh, this thing. Local envelopment we have already discussed. Leave visitors alone. Manage the local necrosis with saline dressings. Prophylactic systemic broad spectrum antibiotics have to be given. Surgical decompression once the hemostasis is attained. Elevate the affected limb, tetanus toxin, and paracetamol or tramadol for pain and avoid NSAIDs. Care of the bitten part we have already discussed. Traditional methods will do more harm than good. Antibiotics are needed in such uh, bites with the local infection because they may go, they may need anaerobic. anaerobic coverage as well. Suppose we are in a situation where there is no ASV. So even in that situation, neurotoxic envenomation, if we do take care of the respiratory paralysis by assisted ventilation, patient will have complete recovery if we will be able to support the patient till the period of recovery. And in other situation, we can also try Anticholinesterases. If we are in a place where we can act, we cannot see ventilatory support as well. We can uh, give atropin plus neostigmine injection. Supportive therapy. All these patients will need ICU admission. For patients with comatose, respiratory paralysis, hypotension, pulmonary edema, and history of syncope. Patients with presence of fang marks, moderate pain, minimal local edema, erythema, ecchymosis, and no systemic reaction, we can treat them in the ward. But they also need close monitoring. Coagulopathy with bleeding, we will give FFP. Neurotoxic symptoms, definitely these patients give intubated and intubation and mechanical ventilation. This is the trial of anticholinesterase. We will see the base and give atropine 0.6 milligram and followed by a, uh, neostigmine 2.5 to 5 milligram. And we will reassess the patient and in 30 to 60 minutes and we can repeat the dose if the patient is responding. So this is what we expect. But this is useful only if there is a postsynaptic paralysis. That is, it is useful in cobra bite.
So at 12.6 milligram, neosprequin 1.5 to 2.5 milligram we can give. And we will gradually repeat every 30 minutes for a maximum of five doses. And if the patient is responding, we can give, continue this at one hour, two hours, six hours, and 12 hours. But always it is better that we shift those patients to a facility where the patient can be uh, mechanically ventilated if a need arises. But we can use it as a temporary measurement so by the time we can shift the patient. And it is useful only in cobra bite, not in confirmed crate bite because it acts only in the postsynaptic paralysis, not in the crate bite. It's always a problem. There is a misdiagnosis that is patient might come to us with abdominal colic and vomiting due to indigestion, appendicitis, stroke, head injury, ischemic heart disease, food poisoning, tismus, hysteria, Guillain-Barre syndrome, all this will come as differential diagnosis. So we have to keep in mind this could be a snake bite poisoning and all of us might have picked up cases where there is actually no history of snake bite. Antivenom treatment alone cannot be relied upon to save the life of a patient with bulbar and respiratory paralysis. We need to move forward for the definitive treatment like intubation, mechanical ventilation. So what we can do in a village, we need to educate properly. We need to have appropriate facility for immediate transport and we need to train them how to immobilize the limb, what we should do, what we should not, avoid right tunicae. All the field staff should be adequately trained so that we can identify and we can shift the patient to the nearest facility at the earliest. Primary healthcare center, we should have the basic emergency care and resuscitation if needed using airway and ambu bag and anti-venom administration, and where should be doctor, nurse, and we should be prepared for treating uh, anaphylaxis if there are adequate facilities to resuscitate and manage the patient. And then we can ship the patient to district hospital where the patient may have hemotoxic bite, they may need fresh frozen plasma, there may need more people to care the patient, patient may need ICU facility. All these things are actually this is this I have taken from the uh, Government of India guidelines. And in the tertiary reference center, we have to have dialysis, ICU setup, surgical setup, coagulation lab, and more personnel to manage this patient. So we have to strengthen the health system. We have to have training of all levels of healthcare workers, ensuring infrastructure adequate at each level, antivenom and availability. And we need to have an epidemiology care monitoring. We need to monitor the deaths happening even otherwise. That's actually not coming into our uh, statistics. And we need to have a proper community education for early referral. So we should understand stage bite is a medical emergency. Never ever underestimate history of bite, even if bite marks are not seen. Concerns stage bite in the differential diagnosis of unexplained altered sensorium. Alteration to speech, swallowing, abdominal pain, especially during the rainy season. Adjust anxiety, always transfer in the trolley. They should never be allowed to walk or in the wheelchair. They may suddenly collapse. So we will be in a difficult situation. And uh, actual proper communication is to be given to the patient and the relative, but not to increase the anxiety. We can tell that majority of the bites are non-venomous. No and needs follow-up even if initial assessment is normal. Communication for the need of observation. Patient has to be in the hospital for 24 hours and we have to document it. Proper whole blood clotting time estimation. Patient may say that patient is uh, sleeping. We have to wake up the patient, see whether there is any ptosis. See and be worried about the tiredness of the patient and timely initiation of anti-snake venom. Antivenom should only be given to patients showing symptoms of envenomation because it has got side effects, it, has, it involves cost, and there is a lot of availability issues. So we should not be giving for every patient coming with these of snake bite, even if the person brings a poisonous snake. Bites by small snake should not be ignored or dismissed, and referral if facilities are inadequate, and give the prognosis correctly and we have to tell that the patient might develop complications, might develop uh, severe disease uh, uh, during observation. 
So this is what I have to share with you. And these are the references I have taken. This is from the WHO and standard treatment guidelines uh, from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And there are many, many newer articles are there, but I couldn't uh, get or I couldn't uh, go through because uh, we have just planned it uh, yesterday only. Hope uh, this has given some information. For majority of you, it must be something that we already know. Uh, and uh, I would like to know your interactions also because many of you are managing in your day-to-day -day clinical practice and might have encountered problems, which will be of use to others also. How did you tackle? Thank you so much.